Is Sanabria. What is salsa? Salsa is flavor and spice. Salsa is Latin soul. Salsa is ritmo, rhythm. It started in Africa. Con la coca, skin on wood. Warm, yeah, I'm sweating yeah. a little bit. Oh, it's warm. Hey, yeah. this, this is this is Caribbean music, baby. Yeah, I know. This is, this is black people. Man. Hello, don't you know that's the good stuff? Too. Right on. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> it started in Africa, but what happens when people from that culture are marginalized and experience bias? Dancers that shoot, episode three. While oh, we're waiting for, them, I think we can just uh, get started for now. If I see your uh, tag in, then I'll just. They'll let her in, you know, we'll get started, all right? So, um, first and foremost, I want to thank all of you guys for uh, being on the show. Um, I really, really do appreciate every single last one of you guys for coming on. I know you guys are busy dealing with, you know, all this stuff for your dance companies, respective dance companies, you know, preparing for everything that's going on with COVID and everything like that. So, um, thank you so much for taking out the time to be on this call. I really appreciate every single last one of you guys. Um, so we're just gonna get right into it. Um, I know that there has been a lot, lot going on right now as far as um, the dance community, both in our individual locations as well as the dance community at large. Um, I don't want to concentrate too much on everything that's actually going on. The last thing I want is to, you know, get in, get into you know blaming people and this that and third. Um, I, I'm more about you know, try and figure out solutions, right? So I definitely want to identify the problem, but um, right, Teresa's in the waiting room, so we're just waiting for her. Okay, so she should be in a second. Um, but yeah, but I don't want to concentrate too much on, there she is, you're upside down. <laughs> Can you hear us? I'm good. <laughs> okay, you have to turn your camera if you can. There we go. Cool. She's good to go. All right, cool. Um, made it just in time. I was just uh, you know, going over everything. I was thanking everybody for being able to make it and uh, just wanted to go over you know, how things are going to go for this, this uh, conversation. Um, basically, it's going to be three topics or, or three touching, touching points, right? Um, we want to try and identify what we've experienced as far as uh, bias in the community and our you know, careers uh, as far as dance is concerned. And if we haven't, then, you know, we can talk about the biases that we've noticed from other people or, you know, other, uh, other locations and that sort of thing. And again, I don't want to turn this into a pointing fingers match. You know what I mean? I just want to like touch on the problems at large and then try and go from there, right? So uh, we're gonna start this off. I'm gonna have everybody go and introduce themselves for the people that don't know because this is going on YouTube. So not a lot of people may not actually know who you guys are or what you do. So um, Fuquan, let's start with you, my guy. If you can uh, just introduce yourself and give us a little bit about you. Hi guys, uh, my name is Fuquan Farrell. I'm here in Atlanta, Georgia. I am the director and co-director and co-founder of Fuego Yellow Dance Company. Um, I think that's a Good bit, yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. Awesome. Edwin, let's go with uh, you next. Uh, so my name is Edwin. I'm here based out of uh, DC. And uh, during the daytime, my real job is uh, I'm a kindergarten teacher. And I teach uh, five-year-olds how to dance and more about life values. <laughs> uh, I also dance with uh, CK, Kalakazi student team. Been dancing for like 10, 12 years now. Oh, and, and you guys don't forget to get, um, let us know where you're from too, because I want everybody to know where you guys are from. Um, so my background, I'm from El Salvador, originally. Okay. Yes. Juan, did you say uh, where you were from? I didn't hear if you did or not. I'm representing Atlanta. Atlanta, ATL in the house. Awesome, cool, cool. cool. The dirty South. Yes, sir. Uh, let's go with Monique. Let's uh, have you introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. Hi everyone, um, my name is Monique, Monique Richard. I'm based out of Brooklyn, New York, born and raised. Um, 
I am one half of Movimiento Dance Company with my partner, Mike Garcia. i um, been dancing for over 10 years. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that sums it up. Cool things, all right. Uh, Teresa, let's go to you next. <laughs> Hi, my name is Teresa. I'm from the DC metro area. <clears throat> um, I dance on Ferocity Dance Company, and um, I also run a Zoot Festival in April. And um, yeah, that's my that's my my thing that I do for dance. And my nine to five is I'm a government employee. So. Those government checks. That's awesome. <laughs> <I> love it. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. All right. Cool. 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 So now that we've uh, introduced players, let's. Um, Let's, let's get into the nitty gritty of things, right? So um, I don't know about you guys and as far as, you know, what you specifically experienced um, as far as being in the dance community, um, but I want to see if maybe you guys can touch on a little bit of if you've personally experienced uh, bias in the scene or if you haven't, if you have witnessed bias towards somebody else that might be you know, person of color in the uh, dance community. So um, let's uh, let's basically follow the same <laughs> the same rotation. So Fufan, if you want to uh, start us off, um, have you ever you know experienced anything as far as uh, bias towards you or your partner or your company uh, because of your color in the dance community? All day, every day. Uh, <laughs> so I think the the most basic one that probably uh, happens the most is I get the calls asking about my general classes and they ask the question, are you, are you Latino? Like, no. Why are you teaching dance then? Like, are you sure you're not like even a little bit Dominican or Puerto Rican? I'm like, well, you are Puerto Rican or Dominican and you can't dance. So what's your point? Like, or the constant things like, are you sure you're dancing this correctly? Like, I don't think you would ask anybody else who you saw as your, you know, paisano, like, if they knew how to dance, but the moment you see, you know, someone of my hue who does not speak like you and dances differently than you, um, that's one of the biggest things I get. Cause I mean, I get calls every day. And the first question I'll get is like, why are you teaching this dance? I'm like, what, how does that, what does that mean? How does that make sense? You know, this dance is more open to the world now at this point than it is just to Latin America, um, let alone for you to think that it's just someone who looks like you. Right. Um, or shoot, when it comes to the actual Congress circuit, the questions of like, why, why are you doing so much like Afro stuff in your routines? Or why, why this song? Or why do you dance like that? Is, are you really dancing salsa? I'm like, do you not know <laughs> what this dance is? Do you not know the roots of this dance? Like, and so I will think just those great examples right there, because it doesn't have to be something super intense, right? Just the fact that I'm constantly asked why are you doing this this way? Or why are you doing this dance in the first place? It's kind of like, does this dance really at this point belong to anyone? But if it did belong to someone, wouldn't it belong to people of color more so than it would anyone else as most of this dance comes from people of color? Right. But that's my two cents for now. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, cool, cool, cool. Not cool, but <laughs> thank you for yeah, your cool. input. Yeah. Um, Edwin, Edwin, talk to us, man. Have you experienced anything or have you noticed any experience as far as, uh, as bias in the dance community? You know, as a, as a, I'm gonna say it like this, as a, as a Hispanic teacher, uh, that teaches black kids, uh, there's a lot of biases out there. Uh, and that's every day, bro. In terms of, uh, like my social media, for example, uh, one of the things I get all the time is, uh, can my kids do math or can they read? Um, so like for Kwan say, I am experiencing the experiences through my kids. You see what I'm saying? Personally to me, uh, there have, there have been many cases, but I would say I know how to handle myself. <laughs> like, and I feel like I'm in a, in a position where uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm Hispanic, right? So people look at me, they can look at me the wrong way from both races. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I've been, I've been, a, I'm not, I don't want to say like a victim of it, 
but definitely have felt it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but mainly to my kids, uh, definitely uh, it stands out more. And that for me, it, it gets me heated. Like it, it, it makes me really upset because right now I'm the voice of my kids. Yeah. Uh, and in the dance scene, I don't want my kids to grow up in something messed up, to be honest. Um, but that's for now i mean that's an everyday thing social media is out there can my kids read i mean if it was a white kid would you be really asking can they read or can they write can they do math can they do simple stuff right but because you see a a a, a, a black kid doing amazing stuff the for your first your first you know Shade is to just ask whether can they dance, I mean, can they read or can they do math? Yeah. Like, what would you, and you know, talking about it makes me upset. And it should, honestly, it, it really should. I mean, honestly, that's that's part of the one of the reasons why I really wanted you specifically on, on the show today it was just for the simple fact that because you deal specifically with kids, at the end of the day, you know, the children that we're teaching they're going to carry on the culture. They're going to be the next generation, not only just dancers, but you know, our, our communities. And you know, the last thing that you want is for them to be you know, bombarded with you know, social media and little quips from society, you know, just little, little things that people say under their breath or mutter under the breath, and that sort of thing that just brings them down. You know? And you know, we need people you know, like you to, to point the youth in the right direction. So that's that's one of the main reasons why I wanted to really have you on. Um, know how, how much you are in the community, number one, and number two, working with the youth. Like, that's such a powerful thing to have that positive influence that can lead towards change. So, you know, definitely. yeah. Mo, talk to us. I know you guys, you and Mike, you guys have been performing on, on the uh, Congress circuit for God knows how long now. I know that you had to have experienced something, talk to me. What's been with you? Um, so, like, where do I begin? <laughs> I think um, the experience for, um, not to take away from anyone else's experiences, but the experience as a Black woman in this community <laughs> is, like, well, um, first of all, my my perspective is that of uh, Afro-Latina, right? Um, a lot of times, a lot of people don't know that, that I am actually half Dominican and half Puerto Rican, right? That's awesome. And they see my name, Monique Richard, they're like, what? So, <laughs> right, then, to give you, give yeah, so it, it's, it's all very that. confusing for everyone. <laughs> um, but I'm very much Latina, but, you know, I walk around the world as a black woman because based off of my appearance that's what you see right and i identify as black and all that good stuff um but i get like for Kwan was saying earlier you know oh why why do you dance this how do you know how to teach this and i'm it's so insulting because yeah. i've only been doing this my entire life right like grew up dancing it it's it's part of my culture right and I'm being asked, how do I know how to do this dance? I think in the scene, um, a lot of what happens outside of the dance world, there's a huge reflection of that inside our dance community. Um, I, you know, I just learned recently about my privilege in the community, right? So a lot of times I get the like, is she, is she not, right? Like, People, because I guess I could be ethically ambiguous sometimes, mm -hmm. right? So they're like, is she, is she not? And once they find out that, like, I am Latina, I get the, oh, okay, that makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah. um, like, she's got the past. She's good. Oh, okay, <laughs> yeah, that, that <laughs> yeah. makes sense for me now, right? Yeah. But, you know, so that, that kind of gives me a little bit of privilege compared to, like, let's say just like an African-American, a Black woman who identifies as just Black, right? Their experience is 
even that much worse than mine, right? Like, they don't get that. Oh, I understand there's more, like, internalized, like, bias that, that just comes out to play, right? When we're at socials, we don't get asked to dance. I've seen that. We do not get asked to dance. I, and the only reason I now get asked to dance is because people know me and they know what, like, you know, they see my ability. But when I go to new congresses or places where people don't know me, it's the same thing all over again. I'll have, like, I'll be around a group of women who are white, Asian, Latina, right? And literally they, they'd ask everyone around me and just walk away once they get the, like rejected from everyone else. Mm-hmm. Having someone completely capable of, you know, dancing with you and giving you a good time and, you know, they just ignore us, right? Um, and I know this is a story for a lot of women in the scene. We've, we've all talked about it. It's like, it's an ongoing thing. It's very frustrating. <sighs> Not to mention, there's there's so many layers to this. Yeah. Um, I before I was a I was on a team, um, and um, it's difficult because I wear my hair natural, mm-hmm. and there's hairstyles that they choose that don't I can't do yeah. right. Like you're you're asking me to like straighten my hair to look like you. You know, it's, and it's just, it's just things like that. It's like microaggressions and they don't understand. Oh, why can't you just straighten your hair? Why can't you do, because, you know, that's not my hair. My hair doesn't do that. Yeah, exactly. And so this, there's just this, like, the default is the European standard of beauty, right? So we have to kind of adapt to that. Then there's costumes. We have an issue with costumes whenever there's like, like a mesh or nude and it doesn't match our skin complexion right Right. like it's like you know we look completely like awkward in like these mesh colors that don't match our skin look like we look like you know i don't even know how to how to describe (laughs) what that looks like but it's not cute right and (laughs) it's just something that there's that we, we just don't get considered for these things and you know, and as as a person who enjoys watching shows and you know, at like seeing people, other people dance, there's not enough representation, Absolutely. and so that that's a bias right there. Like, yeah. I I don't see anyone out there that looks like me, right? And I'm not just talking about black. I'm talking about all types of diversity, right? Body yeah. diversity, right? Like body types. Um, se- uh, sexual orientation. Like we need more diversity. I'm just I'm going off on a tangent. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, um, these are the, th- the things that I've experienced that are very frustrating. Um, and I'm sure like Teresa can, you know, attest to all of this. Um, and I think Black women d- get it the worst in this community. Teresa, I, one of the reasons why I really wanted to bring you in because you bring a different aspect into this. Um, so you primarily specialize in bachata and zouk, and you know both of those dance styles have a very heavy Afro-Caribbean, Afro, um, Afro-Cuban influence to them. Um, but with those specific dance communities, um, have you experienced? you know, biases that you could, that you noticed, or is it, you know, any better than what you may have seen in other dance communities? So, um, in Bachata, specifically, uh, I've been in that for, uh, dancing that for a little while. Um, uh, my biggest gripe with the Bachata is that, um, the really high level teams, um, you don't see a lot of, um, representation. Um, you might see it on, like, like a franchise team or something, and it's almost like our, it's like, are there not any of us that are good enough? Or is it just that there's a preference on what's being showcased? Um, and so I, I find myself questioning that, not, not within my own, my own team per se, because that's not the case with Frosty and whatnot, but um, just across the board in general, it's just like, are there not 
are there not enough that are that are that are really great even in the, in the professional ranks like Bianca Chapman there's only a few a handful of them so um, that can get a little disheartening sometimes um, but I do notice that especially since I attend a lot of events it's just something that I notice with the chat that it's like okay there's just not a whole lot um, with Zook in particular um, I will say that the local DC Zook scene has diversified a lot in the last two years um, I'm on a lady Zoot team, and that team has diversified uh, exponentially in the last like two years. Uh, but before that, uh, it was pretty much like me, like one other person. <laughs> um, the biggest uh, hurdle in Zoot, and, and this might sound really petty and superficial, but it's the hair. <laughs> it's the hair. <laughs> like everybody wants the long, flowing Zoot hair. hair, yeah. Um, and it's it puts pressure on. Um, women of color who don't necessarily have that soft flowing um, hair. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, like I didn't let go of my weave until <laughs> until <laughs> the quarantine hit, you know? And I put a picture up on Facebook and I'm not gonna lie, I was nervous putting that picture up on Facebook. So I was like, I was like, how are people gonna react to this? Cause some people were fooled and thought it was my real hair. It's not, <laughs> yeah. so I didn't know how I was gonna be received. And I know that might sound really silly, but it's because of that that kind of thought process of, oh no, the straight hair is better. No, we need to have it straight and, and, and whatever. So um, that is something that I noticed. And same thing like uh, with Monique's side costumes. I've been on some franchise teams um, where they'll have a flesh tone and the flesh tone doesn't remotely match. So I find myself dying and putting makeup on the flesh tone part just to oh, try wow. to get it to match my skin um, because it's, it's, it's very obvious when it's like, yeah. not not matching you you know or even something simple like jazz shoes like i have to scour the internet to find darker jazz shoes that match my skin tone right. you know it's it's having to go that extra length just to kind of just to fit yeah, in because so, yeah. the, the the default is not for you right okay yeah that's well unfortunately um people i, I really don't think that people realize how big of an issue it is for people of color that may not be just full on Hispanic or even even partly Hispanic. Um, just for the simple fact that, you know, you hear salsa, you hear mambo, you, you hear bachata, you hear cha-cha, and you see people that, you know, are performing it or teaching it or anything along those lines. And they there's a certain expectancy with that. There's a certain, you know, skin tone expectation, there's a certain hair expectation. Um, and unfortunately, those expectations take away from our actual experience and what we know how to do and what we have, you know, bled, sweat, and cried about over God knows how many years, you know. And I've, I'm, I'm just going to touch real quick on on my personal experiences since everybody you know gave theirs. Um, two experiences that really stood out to me. Um, back when I was working at uh, one of the local dance studios here in Philly, um, and this was when I, I had already finished teaching at most of the dance studios around, around so I had arrived at this one. I started teaching beginner and intermediate classes, and uh, I was teaching beginners because I, I really do love teaching beginners. Even, even with all the high-level classes, I love, you know, helping people get into, you know, the spirit of things and helping them how to get into this community and how to, you know, be confident in their foundations. I, I personally like doing that. And I was teaching this beginner class, and I don't know how you guys do you guys' classes, but if I don't have a partner during, you know, whenever I'm teaching, I'll pull, you know, whoever is, whoever's in the crowd or in the class to, you know, help me demonstrate at the end of the class. And so I pulled this young woman out, and because she specifically actually did the lesson the best out of you know, all the girls there. So I was like, all right, it's probably a good idea to have the person that did it the best so that way everybody else in the class can see how it's going to be done. So bring her out to the middle. We, we demonstrate it. Class ends. I'm, I'm not really, you know, thinking anything of it afterwards. I'm thinking, you know, this is a great class. That people enjoyed themselves. They walked away happy. And I can't ask more than that. So then I get an email from the front desk two days later stating that, the person that I had pulled out to the middle to demonstrate the class went to the front desk and said that I basically was hitting on her by bringing her out to the middle to you know teach this class, right? 
Now, here's the thing. This, now, this, this was a Caucasian woman. And you know, before anybody says it, I have nothing against any person of any specific background or anything like that. I'm just saying factually and objectively, that's who she was. That, that was her background. Um, when this all happened, you know, the front desk told me, oh, you know, don't worry about it. This, these types of things happen and, and that's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and just to let you guys know, we're starting to run out of time. So if I need to, I'll start a new, uh, a new room and we'll just switch over there just so you guys know. It, it just sent a message saying that you just upgraded the meeting and now we have unlimited minutes. That's what it said. Oh, yes. All right, cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, but, uh, you know, the front desk, they were telling me, yeah, you know, don't, don't worry about it. it. This sort of thing happens. And here's the thing, right? Now, right after George Floyd was murdered, unfortunately, that same week, there was, I think, two or three reports of Caucasian people calling the authorities on people of color for literally doing nothing. There was this young woman from uh, New York City that called the police off on this one person of color, this one black woman that was literally just sitting in Central Park and not doing anything. Like, she made such a scene out of it that her husband had to walk away with the kids. Um, there was another instance where a gentleman in Minneapolis, the same city where George, George Floyd was shot, um, there was this, this gentleman that you know, was in a gym with three other uh, gentlemen, black gentlemen, and mind you, these gentlemen were members of the gym. And this Caucasian gentleman called the cops on them because according to him, even though they showed their badges, was saying that, you know, they didn't belong there, right? And I say all this because little things more often than not turn into bigger things. Things get, unfortunately, taken to the next degree, right? And my biggest concern and my biggest fear is teaching a class and having somebody, you know, say that I, I might have been coming on to them. And next thing I know, I have a lawsuit or something along those lines that I'm harassing a, 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 a client, not a client, a, a student, then the cops get involved. And at the end of the day, we, we've seen time and time again that people of color, whenever the cops get involved or, or any type of law enforcement get involved, there's a real chance that we might not walk away from that. So to have that sort of thing happen and knowing in the back of my mind that, okay, I, how, how do I rectify this so that way I don't put myself at risk of getting into that type of situation, right? So there was that. There's another situation where, now this is going back to when I first, first started teaching like years ago. This is back like seven or eight years ago or something like that. Um, I had this one student, wonderful student, Caucasian woman. Um, she's nine stories tall. Like, I don't know why I always get like the super tall students and I'm like five foot four. So I'm like half her height or whatever. But she was a great student, came into my class all the time. First one there, last one to leave, was very dedicated. So she was an awesome, awesome student. Those are the ty type of students that I like to work with. Um, and then all of a sudden she just disappeared off the face of the planet. I didn't see her for like five, six years. So, you know, obviously I was like concerned, but you know, she dipped off all of her social media and everything like that. So nobody knew what the heck happened to her. So fast forward to like five, six years later, I met one of the local dance socials and she walks in. Now me being me, I walk up to her trying to give her a hug and say, you know, Hey, how you doing? Where, where have you been? I'm glad you're not dead. You know? And she just looks at me up and down and just walks out. I was like, what was that all about, right? So she messaged me after the social and says, hey, Brandon, sorry, you know, I, I was rude to you, but, you know, I was feeling some kind of way because the last time we danced, you walked away in the middle of the dance. Now, mind you, this was five, six years ago. Number one, I never walk away from a dance unless you, unless you just have a foul body odor and you just didn't wash or you're just being rude to me during a dance. I don't walk away from this. I've never been known to do that. That's not what I do. Because I've had that happen to me. I know how that goes, right? Um, so I text her back. I'm like, look, I don't remember ever doing that. But if I did, I apologize. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, you know, I would rather, you know, us move on, you know, positively. And she's like, oh, okay, it's, it's fine. No worries. Didn't think anything of it. 
Next thing I know, next day, one of my friends sends me a post of this one gentleman that actually took the messages between me and her and me trying to figure out what exactly I did wrong and apologizing for something that I didn't even know I did. And this gentleman put it onto Facebook and basically I got attacked by everybody in the local dance scene and outside of dancing. I had like people that were really good friends going onto this post and saying, how dare he, he should, he should know better. This is what's wrong with the instructors today. And it's like, un unfortunately I got Karen and you know, people that know me know that I, one of the main things that I try and do is try and contribute to the growth of the community, especially locally. And now because of this one person, unfortunately this one quote unquote Karen, um, there was basically people like, you know, basically on my name and they didn't even know who it was that they were talking about because he blacked out the names. It was like, if you're going to talk, if you're going to talk about me and throw me under the bus like this, the least you could do is, allow me to defend myself, you know? And unfortunately, I highly doubt that, you know, if I weren't a person of color or if, you know, some other type of criteria had actually happened, that that would have never happened, you know? I, unfortunately, these are the types of things that goes on with this community if you're a person of color. And unfortunately, it gets marginalized, I, I believe. and. You know, none of us deserve that, especially when a lot of us put in the exact same amount of work as everybody that is a non-person of color in this community. In some cases, probably even more so. You know, so I really believe that, you know, we have to figure out something to try and rectify that because this community, this dance, this culture, this art, it's meant for everybody. Yes, it has specific beginnings and roots, but it's meant for everybody. So everybody should respect it on the same wavelength, right? So that's going to take me into the next topic. Um, basically what, in, your, in you guys' mind, what do you think that we can do as people of color to try and maybe push things in a positive direction? Or do you guys have any suggestions on what can be done from a systemic level to help things move forward. Lupin, what's your, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I would just think that, the, I think we've all said it, diversification is one of the biggest things that affects us. And I think it's more than just on the stage or social dance floor, even the classes that are offered at Congresses don't represent the wealth of information and diversity in this dance. Yeah. And so like, I know when to catch them right for this, but for instance, a good example in my mind is the fact that in our scene, we're more upset, accepting of say Kizumba and Zouk than we are of like Cha 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 or Merengue or Bolero uh -huh. <laughs> or one of the thousands of other dances we have available, right? Yeah. Um, and what's funny is because Kizumba's gotten famous at, the, at this point for having all these very interracial couples, right? Which is a whole nother, a whole nother subject matter. But it's like the things that Kizumba and Zouk got famous for or like the opposite of what dance should be famous for in the first place, right? Should be about, about culture and community and the fact that you actually like to dance, not like necessarily selling sex or, you know, selling a certain vibe, you know, which unfortunately, because it's not what Kizumba and Zoo necessarily are, but it's what a lot of the marketing is sold as, right? Yeah. So it's just like, why are these other dances that are part of our tree not being like celebrated or taught at Congresses? People don't even know that they're like, you know, part of the same, you know, family tree. Same reason why you have like artists being brought all the way from Europe to teach like Afro fusion classes when there's you know never any actual Cuban masters being brought up, or people who actually like come from the culture that the classes are being taught in, right. um, you know. Or a good example, right? The reason why we use the word or the company name Fuego Yellow is one of my Gordon basically told me forever ago. Like I know you're not trying to go on stage saying Fuquan and Candace are you? That's not going to work. I was like, I, and I didn't get that at that point. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, ain't no one going to be like, Fuquan and Candace. Like, who are these <laughs> on stage? <laughs> you got to change your name to have a stage name or you need to have a company name. And I was like, well, damn. Like the whole reason, <laughs> like, obviously our company name has other meanings to it at the same time, but like, like we could have easily just been Fuquan and Candace 
if the world was more open to a name that's different. But most Latinos can't pronounce my name. You know, they're like, fuck one? <laughs> <laughs> fuck Juan. 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 I'm like, it's two syllables. If I could pronounce Virginia, if I could pronounce Mercedes, if I could pronounce your name, I don't think my two syllable name without any lists or accents should be very hard for you, right? But is that lack of attention to detail? Is that lack of acknowledgement that there's more to the world besides your small scope and that there's more to this world? So if we were to have, you know, more representation in the class offerings. For instance, how often do we have actual people teaching the musical history and culture of the dances that we're learning, right? If we do, how packed are those classes, you know? Um, how often do we see a lineup where there's actually like well-renowned people of multiple colors, let alone just the typical, oh, I look Italian. Um, especially because most people nowadays, the fad nowadays is Afro movement again. Like people want that right. Afro stuff, really sh Afro, but they're doing Afro. So if you're doing Afro, if that's coming back in the vibe, why aren't you having more people of the actual culture that it comes from being a part of this movement, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that and same thing with music that's being played at the Congresses or at the socials. Everyone wants to play the same with romanticas, the same salsa duras over and over again. Same thing with performances. How many times do you want to hear in this Tible in a Congress night or <laughs> Mambo Bimbe? Like all these same songs are used over and over again when there's so much music and so much diversity in the music. Like, do you just not know or do you just not want to go out? Because people ask me all the time, like, how do you find your music? I'm like, YouTube. <laughs> like, type in salsa in YouTube and go and have it. <laughs> And you might find something that no one's ever used because everyone uses the same songs. Yeah. So I really feel like if it's just diversified more and not saying that everyone on the Congress roster be black because there aren't that many. Candace and I were talking about the other night. There's not a lot of actual black identifying couples out there. Yeah. Like when you think about it, it's you and your partner, Monique. It's me and Candace. There's like Terry and Cecile. And I want people to name other couples that are right. Really, it's like that. Like, that's pretty much name it. Name some more. <laughs> like it's okay. one thing. To like oh, it's one. One of the people is black or blackish. Like <laughs> go ahead. Skylar and Khalil. Okay. Yeah. 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 You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. You're right. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Mark and Rose. <laughs> Mark and Rose. They're fairly new though. I even think about them, and they're more like Kizumba than they are yeah. like Sasa. Yeah. yeah. So, but. How it's still like it's still not even both hands yet, like being used up. Yeah. And so you think about the fact that there's just so little representation of a dance that predominantly comes from the African diaspora, right? And it's just I just think it just needs to be more diversity. Like we we as artists, we as teachers, we as students need to all say because our money makes sense to these organizers. They have artists based on who they think is gonna sell tickets, you know. Mm -hmm. So the other thing is that means they don't value us, mm -hmm. you know? Because I, I know f talking to Gordon, talking to Sekou, talking to everyone, talking to Edison in Canada, like how hard it is a road to represent their version of artistry in a Congress, right? And have people be like, what the f is going on? Like, what is this? What's it supposed to mean? Like, it's dance. It's not supposed to be the same cookie cutter formula not every team can do the same old-fashioned mambo routine. Everyone will get bored. So it's just people are literally locked into this really small box of what they think salsa and bachata should be. And the moment you have these few artists trying to break it out, it's kind of like, no, I don't. I don't. So it's, I think we just need to be exposed to more and have the scene diversify more. That's me personally. And when I see you raising your hands. Yeah, no, <laughs> notice what he's saying, because what I've noticed also is that if I notice that the talent of uh, like the talent, the, the, the level of talent with certain instructors, right? And I know that a lot of my friends and my kids uh, mentors are black and their price is up here because it's up here. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? And then right. when, you start, when, you, when, when people ask them or when, you know, I don't know, when they get asked to go to a Congress and you, t they tell you their prices and they're like, damn, we thought you'd be cheaper. Cheaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. a lot. And this is, this is coming from Seku, from uh, Mitchell. Like these are top dogs that people don't recognize the talent because, yeah. because of the color of the skin. 
Oh, oh wait. Back off your point, Edwin. The ones who are famous, not naming any names. Oh, I'm naming names. Behind, it's hard to get behind them because they don't even identify with their color. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's 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 a whole another black. conversation. <laughs> I'm not black. <laughs> I'm not yeah. black. I mean, like you know that the slaves got off there first before they came up. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> the original slave. Like what? <laughs> Just like mine, dude. Like what kind of sense do you make? <laughs> it's funny because you look at the artists who made the music we're dancing to. You know, you look at like uh, Ray Barreto and all these guys. They wore like the old school pimp suits and they wore their afros and they wanted mm-hmm. to be black. Their last concert was in Africa. So how did it come so far to where the artists who made music love their black skin love their black heritage to nowadays where people will not run from it like like you do know that like the sun hates white people right like it's literally <laughs> it's trying to kill them at all points it's like why are you trying to identify with that like i love my white brothers and sisters but like come on man like the sun is literally trying to kill you like <laughs> like be proud of what you are like because self-hate is not good and obviously it's just part of the culture because so many countries for a long time have taught that that sense of I'm, you know, just so Indio. I'm not Dominican. Oh, I'm not black. I'm Dominican. I'm Indio. I'm Indian. Like, no, no. no. <laughs> it's okay, though. But it's just, you know, it's, if people aren't educated, if people aren't forced to hear, it's just, you know, Gordon just posted the other day about his experience with Albert years ago. I don't know if you saw this post, but Gordon performed at one of Albert's tourist uh, events before ever go, probably in LA. And Albert said, you know what? I don't understand why you got to do so much black stuff. And I'm like, mm-hmm. you know, not to speak ill, but mm. I'm like, do you not see your own skin, brother? Like, <laughs> do you not see your hair texture? Like, and the dance itself, the music itself, the culture itself comes from Africa. So it's just a lot of self-hate, man. Like between it, not being educated and not being diverse, this scene has a lot of problems that is just, it's not noticeable because everyone's having so much fun when it comes to the social dancing. But that's just a mask for everything because at the end of the day, the fun stops at the point. It's like, I'm busting my ass to educate these people and they don't really take any information, you know? Mo. Um, oh. Teresa had, um, I see her, she, I know she oh. has a few things to say. Oh, sorry. I just, I personally, um, I take it very personally um, that where there's lack of representation. I know for for me in the, the Zook world, of all of the major Zook organizers in the scene, and this is not just in the US Congress, Zook Congress record, this is like in Europe too. There's four, four, mm. me, Sammy, DC Zook Festival, Jilson from Ibedia, Brazilian Dance Festival, Amsterdam, and Adam, from Dutch Zoot Congress. A whopping four Zoot organizers of color in the entire major Zoot Congress circuit. So for me, like that bothers me um, because it's, it, it's, it bothers me because it's like, and it drives me to like do like a, a, a the best quality event I can do because it's like, I don't want to be put in a position where it's like, you, you know, you messed up. We knew you were going to mess up. We knew you weren't going to put together a good event because you're not Brazilian or whatever, you know? So that, for me, that, that, that bothers me where there's not representation at all the different layers, you know, and structures. Um, but it's, it just especially bothers me at the, con- at the organizer level because that's like the business level. Yeah. Um, and that's where it really like, kind of bugs me personally. And I really would like to see more representation uh, in, that, in that arena. Definitely, definitely. Mo. Um, what, what, what do you think that can be done to try and push progress forward? Yeah, so there's a lot that can be done. Um, I think um, it starts it starts like with the instructors in the in the in the classroom in the dance studios. It starts with their local socials, right? Um, being in New York, we have you know the very popular socials out of there. And at those socials, what do you see? There's always a camera there, right? And yeah. so when they're recording and they're and they're, you know, seeing two people social dance, what we need is to actively try and get other people 
right? We do not need to see the same elite dancers over and over and over again in the same video, social dancing with the same people. There are so many people out there who can dance, who can put on a show, who can be like, you know, you'd want to click on that video and watch it. So we need to start there, right? Because once people of color can see themselves, they'll be more willing to stick around. So yeah. many people of color leave the community, right? Like they come in wanting to do it because the music is attractive, the dance is attractive. And then once, but like, like Fakwan says, once they stop having fun and they see like the, the, the microaggressions, they're out, right? So we don't, we don't get the opportunity to grow in this and make it to the stage, right? And so this, there's, there's not that many of us who are actually trying to be on stage yeah. because they're they're pushing us out from when we start social dancing right i think that it, it needs to start there so i personally have seen um organizers tell their videographers who to uh who to record right mm -hmm. and like let's let's get some diversity there the the organizers need to actively look for diversity right with ev all types of diversity you know um uh, disabilities uh sexual orientation like i said before uh body diversity all of that right because there's still there's so much talent there so much talent there um i think we need to really really focus on uh learning about the cultures because what this goes into is cultural appropriation right mm -hmm. it's no longer cult cultural appreciation right like i i grew up dancing bachata and unfortunately i feel like the scene has bastardized bachata Okay, no. I think, <laughs> I mean, I'm all for, I'm all for evolving and, and, you know, that, that's what's going to happen with art, art evolves, right? Mm -hmm. But you, you can't stray away from, like, how do I go social dancing, right? I walk into a bachata room, right? I ask the DJ, can you play like a typical bachata song or whatever? Mm -hmm. No, because no, because you know they don't dance that. I mean, we would just try it, and you know what? The DJ was right, right? He played the song, and guess what happened? Everyone left the the, the, the room, mm -hmm. and I was like, "What?" And then I social dance with someone, and I get told, "Oh, you know, uh, this is. Are you, do you know how to dance bachata? <laughs> what you're doing is not bachata, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so that's just that's a whole separate. That, that's a whole other issue. Yeah. I think we need to really." Are teaching right you can't you can't change something without really understanding where it's from right once exactly. you do that once once you start teaching the roots of of something and and people will then start to appreciate it and will no longer appropriate it right, right? therefore wanting to see the people who the culture belongs to in Batata, there's so many actual dominican dancers right like black dominican afro dominican dancers who are being um, highlighted, right? right? Because they take it to Europe. And all the Spaniards are dancing by <laughs> and, and getting hired for Congresses, yeah. right? So we need to focus on learning the roots of all of these dances. Because the, the common denominator is that, you know, you'll find a whole lot of Africa in there. And <laughs> once that happens, you know, maybe we'll see some changes. And we need to, we have money, right? Like the black dollar is very powerful, right? We have the ability to, to make some changes. And I think I, I do sense a movement happening also in, in, in our dance community. And pe people are now seeing who to support and who not to support, right? Yeah. Even if it's not genuine, if we get people to say, look, we need to appease these people, right, just so they can shut up, that's a, that's a way forward, right? That's a way forward for us. So we need to really push with our, with our money and who we support. There's, a, there's so much talent in, with, with Black dancers in our community. And those, those of us who have 
somewhat of a platform, right, who are pushing through, we need to start, uh, you know, passing the rope back and, and bringing everybody else with us. Like, if we have to mentor each other, we have to, like, create some type of program that is going to help us, you know, advocate for each other, so be it. Be it. And, yeah. and in general, I think the, commu the salsa community or the dance community in general needs, like, a whole HR department straight up, <laughs> right? That's going to include a diversity and inclusion, right? Because we're dealing with sexual assault, we're dealing with discrimination, we're dealing with all the isms in this community. If we have some type of, I don't know, whatever, I'm gonna see <laughs> HR department, you know, maybe things can um, get better. So that's just my two cents. Gotcha. Um, yeah. <laughs> that, that discussion of having a, a governing body, sorry, Brandon. No, there you go. <laughs> The discussion of having a governing body has definitely come up um, a lot in the zoo community and um, they're making some headway on trying to get that set up and established because even within our own microcosm of zoo, there, there's a barrage of issues just like there are in Machata and Salsa and whatever else. So to have something like that that kind of regulates and puts some kind of standardization in place would be amazing. Difficult, challenging, yes, absolutely, but I think we would see a lot of change um, across the board in the community, not, not just in terms of like racial representation, but in terms of the other issues that we have going on, like sexual abuse, things like that, um, that, that would really, really help out um, a lot. Yeah, and also in terms of what you were talking about, Monique, with the, the videos, yeah, okay, I really make it a point to highlight uh, people in the scene like throughout my scene um, when I when I do have my event and also too if you're in that group the black of the berry shout out um, <laughs> there was uh, some discussion in there about um, what's what's the IG page social dance TV yeah yeah, yeah. and um, how they could and should hopefully feature more dancers of color I think I've seen a little bit more of that on that particular channel but yeah it's just it's a matter of seeing more representation actually in front of our faces and on those large-scale platforms like social dance tv and whatnot um that would make a huge difference yeah definitely definitely um two things uh i don't know speaking to you know having a quote-unquote governing body i don't know if you guys noticed but uh rudy from uh, island touch he actually did a po posted a video recently about an idea very similar to that and basically what he was suggesting was to have a governing body that instead of being made up by the promoters and the DJs and, and the artists that, you know, some of them, you know, unfortunately, they may not have the, the, the community's best interest at heart, um, to have made up by social dancers, like local social dancers, um, maybe retired DJs, maybe retired promoters or something along those lines, people that don't stand to Profit. Yeah, profit or benefit, you know, from from that, uh, from being in the position. And I really do think that that's actually a, a fantastic idea. So shout out to Rudy from Chop from <laughs> Island Touch for that. My bad, dude. Um, yeah, but me personally, what I've been doing, so I, uh, I've kind of stepped away from teaching at uh, local studios. Um, and I've been working primarily with some of the schools in the area. Um, I work with Temple University here in Philly local, uh, locally. Uh, shout out to Asensio Latina, as a matter of fact. But basically every semester, every first semester, um, you know, before we even start our choreography, before I start training and everything like that, I sit the entire class down. And where we practice, we actually have this like huge projector uh, set up. And so, and it's hooked up to YouTube, it's hooked up to, you know, computer, everything. So very first class that we have every semester, I sit everybody down and I put on this video from YouTube. It's this video from, I think it's like the seventies or something like that. But, uh, any sign up, Izzy Santa Maria, he's, he's on stage at this, this huge event. And, you know, back in the day, he was like one of the, you know, most well-known MCs you know, in, in salsa. And so he's like getting ready to introduce his band and, and he goes on, on the mic and he's like, what is salsa? Right. And the very next line that he says is started in Africa. And from there, he literally goes through the whole history and every single piece that every single culture, you know, added to the music, he'll have, you know, a different part of the, uh, of the orchestra behind him, like contrib contributing to it. So you can literally see the culture building to what is salsa right in front of your eyes. 
And he does this in a matter of like two or three minutes or something along those lines. And it really does help people in those classes that I teach, you know, get into the heads of, oh, this isn't, you know, just from Puerto Rico. It's not just from Spain. It's, it's like there's a whole culture that goes along with this. And all of that culture has roots in Africa. That's where this started. Like you, you hear them calling out their reaches in some of the songs. You hear the percussion that are specifically African instruments. Like, I think that we as instructors, we really do have a duty to try and infuse more of the history and more of culture into what it is that we teach. And yes, it does go towards, <laughs> it does go towards, um, you know, giving more, uh, you know, attention and light to people of color that may not have had it in the past, but it helps towards the understanding of the culture of the music of the dance as a whole, that you acknowledge those foundations and you acknowledge those roots. So I think that, you know, as more instructors, you know, take it upon themselves to um, recognize the roots and the foundations that we will eventually see more progress you know, in, in our community. And I do hope that that does happen. It's not all about just, you know, turn patterns and who can turn the fastest and, you know, who looks best on stage. Like there is so much more than that. And this is where it comes from, you know? And I think that, you know, it does definitely need to be acknowledged more. And once that does happen, I do think that we'll see, you know, serious change that will benefit everybody, you know? So that's my thing. <laughs> I think the hard part with that is that there. I hate to be rough like this, but I think the majority of instructors out there don't have information to give. That's why our salsa scene in general has gotten so weak is because most instructors can only teach a very basic understanding of what they have themselves, let alone the musicality, the history, the culture. Like it's hard enough for them to teach footwork and partner work because they don't know what's going on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because it's such a cash cow, people, the people don't know any better and it's like the spectacle of it it gives these people this opportunity to teach and it's a catch-22 because we need more teachers out there to be able to help spread this dance in general but most teachers aren't qualified in any sense of the word to teach anything so there's not a lot of people out there who can teach an appreciation for the history of the culture when they don't understand it themselves oh, sorry go ahead <laughs> I feel like this should be like a test, you know what I'm saying, for someone who wants to perform at a uh, at a congress or wants to teach. Mm -hmm. Beto sent me this uh, this uh, it was like a play, like a little game where he was asking. Uh, it was about instruments in terms of uh, mambo, in terms of bachata, and then uh, but it was it was very playful. So basically, it was asking you question, and you had to guess what instrument it was. I feel like there should be some kind of uh, this should be a test. Like, what are you going to teach? Great. Do you know where this dance comes from? Right. And I feel like one of the things that I'm going to push for next year and upcoming years is for every student or performer who comes to our Congress to be on a panel to learn about the history. Like, it should be a mandatory thing. Like, it shouldn't be just like, a, oh, I'm a dancer. Oh, I have this, 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 uh, you know, this celebrity status. I don't need to go to that. that. Like, it shouldn't be that way. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't care. Like, I went to, I went to a, uh, uh, we went to Mumble Land last year. Yes, sir. That's it doesn't matter. Shout out, shout out to Chris Wood. <laughs> Fantastic event. Like, it doesn't matter the level that you are. For me, foundational skills are like the biggest part of the dance. And if you don't know your roots, bro, like, you, where are you going to go? Right. You're going to be a tall ass street with no roots. You're going to fall. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to support you. Mm -hmm. And then my job as a teacher, when someone comes at me and says, uh, why do I want to teach just beginner classes? Because this is where my focus is. And this is yeah. why my kids are good at what they do because they know the, like, if you ask my kids questions about what we were talking about, I bet you, I guarantee you, they know probably On top more. Of the dome. <laughs> they probably know more than some of these uh popular dancers yeah. because my investment has not been on oh we're gonna do suzy q this style no it has been it's been about the roots and my kids know that and i feel like that is lacking in our scene and everywhere i go that's where i see it and i'm like oh, I love it. 
Like, what am I doing? For real. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, I I know I said that uh, I wasn't going to keep you guys, and here we are <laughs> an hour later. So let's get uh, final thoughts from everybody, and then we'll uh, wrap it up because I'm about you guys. Going crazy. So, uh, on final thoughts. What what are you? Uh, what do you think we need to need as far as like? What are your final thoughts on on this topic? So I think we're in a uh, very interesting time because COVID has allowed us time to sit on our asses and reflect on things because beforehand, um, I remember talking to Gordon at a point that not even about races, but about education in general for the salsa scene and how it's not going to get any better until the instructors take a second and come off the road to actually like talk amongst each other and say, you know, what things should we recommend amongst ourselves to our students? that'll help them grow the scene in general, right? And we talked about the fact that it wouldn't happen because that's how most people make their money is by being on the road and traveling to these congresses and performing and teaching and doing their private lessons, right? So I think for the first time in a long time, the scene has just died. There is no dancing, there is no congresses, there aren't any private lessons to do very easily. Even everyone's online classes, not everyone can teach online classes and make the same money that they were making. So everyone has all this free time. So that's why we're just now discussing something like this, our issues with racism in the scene, or our issues with lack of, uh, lack of having qualified instructors on the scene, yeah? So I think what needs to happen is that the talks can't stop um, once COVID is done, because we need to actually make effectual change happen once the scene starts picking back up again, you know? And I think one of the most important things is, like I said, is just how we introduce more diversity into our scene so like I know for me, I said it a long time ago, and people's like, you know, can I hear some Mark Anthony? You in my class, you always go to my <laughs> studio. Um, just being straight up, like I tell people day one, <laughs> I'm here to teach people how to dance. Now you can say, oh, I'm just here for date night. Okay, cool. I hope you enjoy date night, but I'm not catering to you for your date night mentality. I'm here mm-hmm. to teach how to dance, right? And I feel like all instructors have their niches, right? Like some instructors are going to be just, I'm the bubbly person who just teaches date nights and you know, people want to get a little New Year's resolution in. And there needs to be more people though who are like me and say, no, today no, we just- It's time to learn. <laughs> like for real, like, yeah. um, like for instance, I'm the only person in my city that does an afro Latin fusion class, like the only one. Like we have an afro Mama class on Thursdays and that's the only afro fusion class like for our scene in this entire city. Um, which is funny because Atlanta is like Black Mecca, right? You would think yeah. that. <laughs> but it's, in general, people don't cater to that thought process, right? I, most of the conferences I go to, like, hey, hey what class do you want to teach? I'm like, oh, I'm teaching Afro Mama class and a cha-cha. They're like, oh, you know what? We don't have any of that. I'm like, I know. <laughs> who does? Like, who, what? <laughs> what? Like, so I, I, for a long time ago, decided that I wanted to be, or well, I didn't want to be, I am different. And so I celebrate my differentness because who wants to look like everybody else out there? That's how you get forgotten. That's how you don't become yeah. anyone. And we've become who we are because we are different. And I feel like if people actually accepted that thought process, that being different is good because if you think about it, salsa is different. Salsa is an amalgamation of a bunch of different stuff, right? From a long period of history and a long time of turbulation, you know, because it comes from slavery, you know? Right. <laughs> so it's not like it comes from a good place, right? So if people actually celebrated the diversity, if people were actually taught to understand that diversity is a good thing and can help you grow as a dancer, as a person, I feel like the scene would grow. So that's, you know, I know I'm beating a dead horse, but it's just, it's just getting more diversity out there, you know, and all the levels. Like something that Teresa uh, commented on was the fact that she's one of the few organizers uh, for her scene. How many organizers are there in our scene that are black, right? Or creative directors or the stage managers, anybody on any of those levels right um and i think about it i think about like people like chicago chicago is like a really black congress right dc is run by shock but it's kind of like how many others were there like new york did have choco before he passed but there's not a lot of people out there so you like like you, know, you hear all these stories like uh i'm not gonna say any names but one of my friends uh from new york who's an afro-cuban guy said this at this event not too long ago and they put all the afro stuff at the beginning of the show like together in one big huddle. And it's like, how, would, how does that make sense? Like, just from a watching standpoint, not even from a just that's bullshit, disrespectful point, but yeah. like who wants to see, you know, 10 straight performances of something that's that similar, right? Typically you break things up to make sure it's not monotonous to the eye and to the ear, right? So it's like, you know, he's like, I'm never going to that conference again because that creative director didn't know what the f- they were doing, right? And it's just like, 
well, maybe if you had somebody who was better at the job or someone who knew what they were looking at, they might not have just assumed that it was, you know, crappy and put it at the beginning, you know? And the thought process is like, why would you assume that because it's Cuban or because it's Afro-based that it's going to be bad, right? Or that's not going to be well-received, you know? Especially because now, like I said, the fad is going back to people doing all this really bad Afro in the first place. So, <laughs> like, if I see one more, like, Chango horse ride, like, anyways. So that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> Edwin, two cents. Let's hear it. <laughs> <clears throat> Ask me a question again. <laughs> So as you were just cleaning up with uh, final thoughts, um, you know, now, again, you know, you have a, a very special position just because, you know, you specifically work with kids uh, for the most part. Um, Not just kids, the black no, kids. Black kids, yes, exactly. Yeah. So with that being said, um, like, are there anything, is there anything that you plan on doing to um, specifically cater to them other than what you're already doing? Or have you heard any ideas that might help with, you know, how you're catering to this specific part of the community? Uh, a lot of the things that we do when we, um, when we look for places to go and take the mm -hmm. kids is mainly uh, representation, right? Like Fuquan was saying, uh, Chicago was the first one that we took them to because because of that. That was the main reason because it's black owned, right? The Congress is, and we want to see the kids represented when we go places. One of my main things. The other thing is, uh, it's people that we respect in terms of personally me, because people out there might have a name but if your vibe is off towards my kids that's it for you and that that, that have that's happened in our congress happened in chicago I'm not gonna name no names but the kids feel the neglect you see what i'm saying they don't have they don't have to you don't have to tell them anything but i got my receipts so for me for my kids it's very for me for my kid for me it's very important that my kids feel welcome. Right? Because I don't want my kids to grow up and feel or experience the same thing that has that has been happening. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And I made it, I have made it a very clear uh point that I'm gonna teach the next generation of black children in DC. And that's my that's my ultimate goal, right? Like there might be Latinos here come and go, but right now my heart is 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 about to make that change, and it might not happen right now. It might it's already happening because they're already out there. But the way I want to do it is I want my kids to go out there and represent, and I want them to be respected for who they are, for how they look, not because of how cute they dance. No, that's another thing. Just because they cute don't mean that no, they, you're gonna respect all of them, and that's that's my main goal. So that's where I stand, and I'm gonna stay behind it. As you should, because your your kids are beasts, dude. I've I've told you this on <laughs> numerous occasions. They they are they are little monsters in a good way, and I I don't even think that they realize how good they are, which is good. Not but yet. That that level of humbleness that's gonna help them go really far. But we talk about that all the time. We talk about it all the time, and I don't think they know their level of talent yet. Cause not because they're my kids, <laughs> but I've seen better shows with my kids and adult groups. And I'm not just saying this because they're my kids. Like you gotta, you gotta recognize talent where 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 there is talent. And I mean, a lot of us would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was set on that. Mo, <laughs> final thoughts. Talk to me. Um, I just want to say, Mr. Soto, those kids are amazing. I <laughs> love watching them. They are fantastic. They are so good, right? They're not cute. They are fantastic. They really They're cute, are. but like, you know, more than that. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, we we focus a lot on what needs to like change and everything. I think um, right now we're 
we're getting somewhere. I think I feel I feel change coming. Even though there's not enough of us out there, I I see us coming out, right? I see I see the videos here and there. So it, we're on the right path. And I think that um sometimes just pushing through that's a resistance us being there is already a resistance yeah. right i think um we we need to sometimes sit there and and, and just appreciate that a little bit right because yeah we want to fight and we should keep fighting but there's a little you know being on stage that mike and i we went to mambo land last year and we performed and i felt like being there was so important to me not for not for like anything that had to do with like me like personal is more about seeing Everyone. black people on stage yeah. at mambo land in milan in italy right so we paid to be there mike and i paid to be there we brought our asses to mambo land right and i think we just need to keep pushing we just need to keep pushing. We're on the right path. There's a, a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm not happy with what, what with what I see currently, but you know, being black is a resistance within itself. So Ain't that the truth. <laughs> <laughs> there is a final thoughts. What are you thinking? Uh, representation, representation, representation at all levels. Like I said before, um, to, to be seen at, you know, at a creative director, director level, at a team director level, at a studio owner level, at an organizer level, at an instructor level, at a performer level, um, it makes a difference. And I, by the way, Edwin, shout out to I, I, those kids. You took them to the I Love Bachata Festival. Um, over, those kids killed it. But the, the best part is that they were in front of a crowd that wasn't the typical Congress crowd. They were in front of a very different crowd. So that representation, that showing was that much more important. So it's mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. It's just being visible instead of being invisible because a lot of some people of color in the scene, especially females, feel invisible on the sidelines, not getting dances at Congresses or whatever. So being visible and being present and being represented um, leads to that, that equality that we're seeking ultimately um, in society, not just within the dance scene, which is a microcosm, but within the greater society. Awesome, awesome. Well, everybody, thank you so much for being on the show today. I appreciate every single last one of you guys. I appreciate everything that you are doing currently to help with that representation and, and putting people of color out there. And I'm going to say that I appreciate what you will be doing because I know that you guys are gonna keep pushing and just putting this on, you know? It, it, it really does mean a lot to me personally, and I know it means a lot to a lot of other people out there that watch you guys on stage, that watch you guys perform, that watch you guys teach. We see what you're doing, and we appreciate what you do. We really, really do. So thank you again, guys. I hope every single last one of you have a good evening. Um, stay safe out there, stay blessed, and uh, hopefully I will be seeing you guys sometime soon. Hopefully the apocalypse will be over at some point so I can see every single last one of you guys. And um, yeah, thanks again, you guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Of course, of course. And thank you, you guys everyone awesome. for the See ya. Yeah, man. You guys have a good night, all right? Good night. All right. Bye. Talk to you.